in this episode. Lying on that table, I saw sort of like little bots running through the periphery of my body. And I saw certain organs that were highlighted in pink or mint green. And uh, I was still in intense pain, but they told me that the healing was almost complete. Well, hello there. I'm Cool Gray, and this is Cool Gray in Studio A. Cool Gray has a cold today, so I'm doing my best Kathleen Turner impression for you. You'll have to bear with me, but I wanted to get this intro and outro recorded for you and get this episode right in front of your face because it's a great one today. We are on episode 17, so if you've been following along, welcome back. If this is your first time, you picked a good one. We're going to wrap season two with this episode today. My guest is Kathleen Martin, who is the niece of Betty and Barney Hill, who are the very first people in this country ever to report having been abducted by non-human entities and the first case to ever be scientifically investigated in this country. So I've got a lot of information for you. I'm going to do things a little differently today. So we're going to start with a little mini a pre-recorded summary of the story because Kathleen's told the story so many times I wanted to spare her that. So I told it for you and then we'll get right into the interview. So this will conclude season two. I'm going to take a hiatus. We're actually going on vacation. We'll be gone for an entire month. So I'll be back with the next episode on the 22nd of June and my guest then will be Shane Thrapp. We're going to talk about navigating the world with ADHD. So I hope you'll come back and join me for that. Also coming up in season three, we have a lot of great things planned. We're going to talk to a neurologist who did a study on near-death experiences in children. I think that's going to be very fascinating. In fact, I know it because I've already recorded the episode. We're going to talk to actors and artists. We're going to talk to a gentleman who is an expert in addiction in adolescence, which probably resonates with some of you out there. And we got some more paranormal stuff coming. So I hope you come back beginning June 22nd. This is a great time, by the way, for you to catch up on what you've missed while I'm off cavorting on my vacation. You can go back and listen to some of the past 16 other episodes that you may have missed. They're all interesting conversations with interesting people on a wide variety of topics in hopes of stimulating deeper thought. So exercise your brain, people. In the meantime, let me introduce you to the story of Betty and Barney Hill, and then we'll meet my guest. Betty and Barney Hill lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where Betty was a social worker and Barney was a postal worker. Late in the evening in September of 1961, they were driving through the White Mountains of New Hampshire, returning home from a trip to Montreal, Canada, when they saw lights approaching from the sky. What followed is said to be the first well-documented, feasibly legitimate UFO abduction in history. According to the Hills, their experience began around 10.30 p.m. while Barney drove, Betty observed a bright point of light in the sky that moved upward. Because it moved erratically and grew bigger and brighter, Betty urged Barney to stop the car for a closer look and to walk the dog. Through binoculars, Betty observed an odd-shaped craft flashing multicolored light. Because her sister had several years earlier said she had seen a flying saucer, Betty thought this might be what she was observing, while Barney reasoned it was more likely a commercial airliner. But when the craft rapidly descended in his direction, Barney realized, in his words, this object that was a plane was not a plane. The hills continued driving slowly on the isolated road, watching the craft as it came even closer. At one point, it rapidly descended toward their vehicle, causing Barney to stop in the middle of the highway. There, it silently hovered about 80 feet above the hills, filling their entire field of view through the windshield. Barney got out of the car and stepped toward the craft. Using binoculars, he claimed to have seen 8 to 11 humanoid figures peering out of the craft's windows at him. He recalled the beings were wearing glossy black uniforms and black caps. 
The Hills reported hearing a buzzing sound, and then there's a period of missing time and memory at this point. Arriving home around dawn, the Hills were surprised to note it was several hours later than the drive should have taken. They reported they had some odd sensations and impulses they could not readily explain. Betty insisted their luggage be kept near the back door, not in the main part of the house. Their watches would never work again. The leather strap for their binoculars was torn, though they could not recall how that had happened. The toes of Barney's best dress shoes were scraped, and he reported that he felt compelled to examine his genitals in the bathroom, though he wasn't sure why, and he found nothing unusual. They both took long showers to remove possible contamination, and they each drew pictures of what they had observed. After a few hours sleep, Betty placed the shoes and the clothing she'd worn during the drive in her closet, noting that her dress was torn at the hem, zipper, and lining. Later, she also noticed a pinkish powder on the dress. There were also markings on their car, which had not been there the previous day. These areas also had an anomalous effect on a compass when placed on the trunk. Perplexed, the Hill said that they tried to reconstruct the chronology of events after they saw the UFO, but immediately after they heard the buzzing sounds, their memories became incomplete and fragmented. In the days and weeks following, Betty had a series of vivid dreams, which she recorded in a journal. About a year after their abduction, Betty and Barney sought hypnosis therapy to help reveal to them the events of the two missing hours. Through many hypnosis sessions, both were able to recall in great detail what had happened, and the things they reported were quite similar in most details. While under hypnosis, they told of being taken aboard the craft with some resistance, causing the scuffing of Barney's shoes and the tears in Betty's dress, of being examined with invasive instruments, and in Betty's case, having telepathic conversation with her captors. They were able to draw pictures of the beings, the craft, and Betty even created a star map indicating where the beings had told her they were from. Over the years, many researchers have sought to either validate or debunk the Hill's account. Their story became the subject of several books, films, and documentaries. After Barney's death in 1969, Betty continued her research into UFOs for the remainder of her life and became one of the most well-known voices in UFO research. My guest today is Kathleen Martin. She is an award-winning researcher, author, on-camera commentator, hypnosis practitioner, and international conference presenter. Kathleen is the founder and past director of MUFON's Experiencer Resource Team, and she's widely considered one of the leading UFO contact researchers of our time. Since 1990, Kathleen has researched and experienced the perplexing nature of contact with non-human entities. She's worked on three comprehensive studies on nearly 5,000 experiencers, and she's published six books. The story of Betty and Barney Hill is best told in her bestseller with nuclear physicist Stanton T. Friedman, Captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience. Kathleen, I'm so excited that you could join me here today. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. Now, we opened my episode in kind of an unusual way. I've read a little synopsis of the Betty and Barney Hill story for those who are not already familiar with it. You were just 13 years old when that experience happened and you were a firsthand witness to their reports after the fact. Would you please share with us a little bit about your first impressions, what was going through your mind and how it looked through your eyes then? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I had just arrived home from school in the afternoon. I'd gotten off the school bus and ran into the house and my mother was on the telephone with Betty. And so I overheard their conversation and I noticed that my mother seemed concerned. Uh, I was wondering exactly what they were talking about. And when my mother hung up the phone, uh, I was able to uh, have a, the rundown of what Betty had told her about how she and Barney had been returning home from a vacation the previous night. 
when they had a close encounter with what they then called a flying saucer. And Betty was concerned because it came so close to them that she was afraid they might have been contaminated. And she wanted my mother to speak with a neighbor of ours who was a physicist to ask him what they should do. So my mother waited for the physicist to arrive home from work and spoke to him. And for some reason, which I now know uh, was to detect a magnetic field, he told uh, Betty if she had a compass to take it out to the car to um, see how the needle reacted. So she did this. She then noticed new shiny spots on the trunk of the car that hadn't been there the previous day. So she placed the compass over those spots and the needle whirled. But when she moved the compass away, the needle dropped down. And this, by the way, was not near the engine, not near the battery. This was at the The trunk trunk of the the car car. where there would not have been a magnetic field. How long after that experience, their their sighting, did that take place? Was that the very next day? That was the day they arrived home. Mm -hmm. And um, who was there for that compass experience, that little experiment? Did the physicist come over? Were you there or was it just them following instruction? Uh, initially, it was Betty and Barney and their upstairs tenants. But then within a couple of days, my family and I were there. And I saw those spots too. And I heard uh, straight from Betty's mouth what had occurred. So what were you thinking as a 13-year-old with all of this activity and, and the hullabaloo going on? Well, first of all, I had never heard of extraterrestrial visitation to our planet. And so this immediately generated uh, curiosity in me. And I became very interested in astronomy. So uh, my father bought a telescope for me and we would go out nights and we would watch the sky. I was already interested in satellites and my grandfather and my brother and I uh, sometimes went out at night to look for satellites as well. So I was uh, scientifically oriented and, and curious and a good student. Yeah. And I imagine because Betty and Barney really were the first, uh, I want to say in this country, but from my reading, it might be in the world to ever it wasn't report something world. like this. It wasn't but they the were the first known case and the first scientifically investigated case in the United States. So when this happened to them, we had no idea that it had happened to anyone else. Yeah, it was pretty groundbreaking. And they were not private about it. They started talking to, uh, well, certainly first your mother and some uh, you know, experts, but also wasn't there an interviewer, a military interviewer or someone who came and spent a good deal of time with them very shortly afterward to interview them? I thought I read something about that. Well, regarding privacy, Barney did not want anyone. More reluctant. Yeah, this, he was but more Betty reluctant. was curious. So my father's best friend, who was the chief of police in the small town of Newton, New Hampshire, advised Betty and Barney to report this to Pease Air Force Base. And being the good compliant citizens that they were, uh, they did call and they made a report to Pease. They also spoke to family members, but we were sworn to secrecy. And then a by few who? days- By Sworn to secrecy by the military? By Betty and Barney. Oh, by them. Uh-huh. They didn't want, I mean, <laughs> they had, they were responsible people. Betty was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. Barney worked for the post office. Uh, they were I- active in the civil rights movement, advocates for civil rights. They certainly did not want uh, the public to have any knowledge of this. They never wanted this to be made public. They were willing to speak to people in the military, Mm -hmm. Uh, to UFO investigators. Betty did write a letter to the Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, a private organization, and she and Barney had a confidential investigation by Walter Webb, 
who was an astronomer at Hayden Planetarium and an investigator for NICAP. Wow. Yeah. So they weren't running to the media, certainly. No. Absolutely not. Um, my impression from reading your book captured and also from other uh, sources that I've been uh, looking at with regard to this story, Barney seemed much more reluctant, not only to talk about his experience, but even to, in, in some cases, it seems even to face the truth of what he had experienced. Uh, and that seems to be what you just mentioned a moment ago, that Betty was more curious and more interested in seeking more deeper understanding of what they had been through it seems that maybe barney was hoping he could close his eyes and make it all go away was that your impression during the encounter itself uh, barney was a confirmed skeptic and this caused him to go into a state of shock because uh, he could not comprehend what his eyes were perceiving so he would pull the binoculars down from his eyes and shake his head and put them back up and it would still be there. And it was hovering only a hundred feet over. Him. And he was observing these non-human entities looking down at him. And it was this and his fear that he was going to be captured that caused him to develop a mental block initially that uh, this was uh, so shocking to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of this caused him to want to forget what had happened, but he still knew what had occurred. Uh, most of what had occurred, in fact, according to the earliest reports that he and Betty made. So uh, it was just his reluctance to speak of any of this. It was so distressing to Barney that he wanted to try to suppress it, to push it down so he didn't have to face those memories. Sure. And I imagine there's a good swath of the population that might have the same or a very similar response. I think we're going to find out what we're made of in a moment like that. And we're either going to go that route or we're going to go the curiosity route if we're not maybe predisposed to if we're more predisposed to curiosity than we are to fear. Uh, and so it seems that between the two of them, they had both of those bases covered. Kathleen, you might be able to uh, correct something in the little synopsis that I've given in the beginning. My understanding was that when Betty and Barney first arrived home, they didn't recall the fullness of their experience. They recalled seeing the craft, seeing the beings, and then um, hearing a buzzing sound, and then there's a, a gap of memory and uh, time for them that they didn't fill in until maybe a year or so later when they underwent the hypnosis sessions. Is that a correct chronology? Well, let me explain very briefly what did occur. Mm -hmm. Okay, So the, the craft hovered, it swooped down, it hovered, uh, 100 to 200 feet above their vehicle, Barney stopped the car in the middle of the highway, grabbed his binoculars and stepped out of the car and looked up at the craft. As he was watching this, Betty was watching from her position in the passenger seat of the car. They saw a disc-shaped craft that was hovering silently in the air. Barney stepped away from the car and when he did, the craft shifted to an adjacent field. This this was uh, a field where there was a little farmer's stand to sell apples. There were apple trees there. And so Barney walked to the edge of the field and he was looking up at this craft that had now descended to uh, maybe within 100 feet of him. And he could see figures looking back at him who were, that were dressed in black, shiny uniforms. This was his conscious recall. He always remembered this. Betty did not see them. Her memory of these entities only came during hypnosis a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. Barney, so Barney was incredibly fearful and startled by what he had observed. They uh, had all been standing at a window looking down at him, but then all but one moved to what appeared to be a panel. 
And the one standing in the window frightened Barney terribly because things started to slide out like little wing-like structures from, from the craft. And something started to drop down from the bottom of the craft. And from the expression on this um, entity who was standing at the window's face, Barney thought they were going to capture him. Yeah. He pulled the binoculars from his face so forcefully that he broke the leather strap. Well, that's and how the strap got broken. Screaming to the car in a hysterical state that they had to get out of there or they were going to be captured. He'd left the car running. The interior light was on because the car door was open and he just got into the car and started speeding down the highway. But as he was entering the car, he looked up and the craft was coming in his direction. Within moments, just a few blocks, Betty and Barney heard a series of code-like buzzing sounds striking the trunk of their vehicle, where those shiny spots were the following morning. Right. And also where there was a magnetic field. So the car vibrated and Betty and Barney felt a tingling sensation pass through their bodies. In fact, Betty felt the metal of the car to see if she would receive an electric shock. It was an electrical tingling they felt. The next thing they knew, they were 35 miles down the highway. They heard a second series of these buzzing sounds that restored them to full consciousness, but they retained vague memories of finding themselves in a new location on a dirt road with tall trees all around. They remembered vaguely a roadblock and a fiery orb that seemed to be sitting on the ground. They drove on home. They were looking for human contact they were looking for a police officer to talk to about this. Um, they wondered if there were other witnesses. Actually, there were other witnesses that night. We have found uh, between us about 16 additional witnesses. Who saw the craft, craft or who, who were also abducted that night? They were not abducted. They were just witnesses to the craft. Was your mother the first person that they spoke to about this? Yes, my mother was the first person that they spoke to. Were you and your mother talking about this just between the two of you in the hours and days following this? We uh, we talked to my father, my little brothers, and that police officer. Um, my grandparents knew about it. They lived across the street, but uh, we were admonished uh, not to speak to anyone else about it. I know, and I think in the Wikipedia that I read about this account, there's a, a sentence that says, Betty, when she observed this craft, had recalled that her sister had seen a flying saucer in the past. And that's why she thought that might be what she was seeing at the moment. Would that be your mom or is that another relative? That is my mother mm -hmm. uh, back in the 1950s, my mother and an aunt. Uh, were making their usual Friday night grocery shopping trip when they, it was after dark, they observed um, this cigar-shaped craft hovering over a field near my childhood home. Uh, they stopped at the home of uh, some neighbors that we knew, and those people went out and they also observed this cigar-shaped craft with smaller craft around it that were somehow entering that larger craft. My goodness. And it's not like there was a precedence for this, you know, like we have today. We hear a report like that and said, oh, yeah, you know, I've heard of those kinds of sightings before. But for it to come at that point in our history when there wasn't really a field of knowledge about this, there wasn't an interview, there wasn't Netflix, there wasn't anything, uh, it automatically lends a great deal of credibility. I know that that area, the Northeast, New England, uh, New Hampshire in particular, 
is what we consider a hot spot for UFO activity. But there's also this concept that these kinds of experiences, when we're actually uh, talking about abductions, or I don't even know if that's the popular word to use any longer. Um, Contact experiences. Experiencers, yeah. That this might have some kind of generational or family connection, not just regional. Um, wh what do you and your family think about that aspect? Well, I have worked on uh, three major studies on experiencers, on about 5,000 in all. And what we discovered is that there is apparently intergenerational contact among about 50 to 60 percent of experiencers today. That's a significant number, but it's actually a smaller number than I was expecting to hear. Um, so well, those uh, are those who remembered contact. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Okay. So the number could and, be larger. Yeah. And knew. Yes. And knew that family members were also taken. I a lot interviewed, of families uh, don't discuss this among themselves. I would. I just, you know, <laughs> it's too fascinating to keep under wraps from my, my perspective, but who knows? I guess one can never really anticipate how they're going to respond in such an extraordinary set of circumstances. I did uh, interview Mike Stevens, who's also from that general area. And I believe, wasn't he the person who was responsible for actually having Betty and Barney commemorated with a, a, a plaque or a sign at the look? Was it at the location where the sighting occurred? Yes, Mike came up with the idea and he collected signatures petition that he submitted to the state of New Hampshire with my help. And then I worked with the state of New Hampshire because I'm, I was the, the researcher who had all of the information on Betty and Barney. I had to submit at least a couple of dozen documents indicating that this was in fact true and uh, also provide text uh, for posed plaque. And were you also personally involved in the, uh, is it the University of New Hampshire that has the special collection and the exhibit uh, with Betty's dress and all of those other amazing pieces of history? Were you involved in putting that collection together? I was, I am the uh, trustee of Betty's estate I had specific instructions from her to go through all of archival documents and materials and uh, to selectively place certain things at the University of New Hampshire in a collection. So yes, I did that. Did she have a, an affiliation with that university or did that just seem like the appropriate place for these artifacts? Betty was a graduate of the University uh, of New Hampshire. That's I where she earned her bachelor's degree. Okay. Entirely appropriate then that that's where it should be. And that exhibit um, can still be seen today? It can be. At, it's at the Milne Archival Collections or Special Collections at the Diamond uh, Library at the University of New Hampshire in Durham. And it's a very popular exhibit. No doubt. Uh, I imagine your life took a trajectory that was deeply influenced by this world altering event in your life. You already mentioned that you took up an interest in astronomy. Where did you go educationally and professionally uh, as you grew up and figured out what your life was going to look like? I had uh, the unfortunate opportunity to observe the emotional impact that this event had, particularly on Barney, but also on Betty. And so I became extraordinarily interested in the field of clinical psychology and memory and cognition. And uh, so I did not study, well, I studied psychology at the University of New Hampshire, but it was uh, focused on, the department was focused on experimental. I was interested in clinical psych. So I ended up uh, studying psychiatric social work and also social research. 
and social psychology. Those are the, the things that I really focused on, uh, in addition to uh, human genetics. Were you uh, beginning the research into this field as early as that, as your educational years, or uh, were you going into more standard clinical psychology and then branching into your UFO research after the fact, or was that just a continuing thread in your life? Well, it was sort of a combination. I did an internship at the university at the State Psychiatric Hospital where I worked with men who were patients, inpatients there. And so, uh, you know, the, just the general population. And then uh, when I ended up moving to Cincinnati, Ohio later, because I was married and my husband was going to graduate school there, uh, I was not able to work in my chosen field. So, and I needed to support the family, but I, so I found a, a position as an educator. So it sort of changed the direction of what I was doing professionally, but not in terms of my interest. Sure. When did you become involved with the Mutual UFO Network? At what point? I joined the Mutual UFO Network in 1991. So quite a few years mm -hmm. later, I was pretty much mainstream in what I had done, except for this uh, intense interest in my aunt and uncle's case up to that point. And I had spoken with people like Dr. James Harder, who was one of the original investigators who would visit Betty and, and hypnotize the family, and Dr. Alan Hynek, and, and with other investigators, knew all of Betty's friends and what was going on in her life uh, as well. But I wanted to join MUFON because I wanted to train to become a field investigator. I wanted to investigate that case myself. I'm, I'm a person who doesn't want to trust what somebody else has done because I'm sufficiently skeptical. Yeah. And I wanted to separate fact from fiction, the yeah. wheat from the chaff. I share that with you. That's part of what I'm trying to do here. I mean, I'm I'm creating a podcast for other people to listen to, but I'm trying to wrap my own mind around this entire phenomenon as well. I don't think I'm taking it quite to the lengths that you have done. I, I wonder if anybody could, but uh, I share that that feeling of you can tell me, but I would really like to figure it out for myself and research it for myself. So with MUFON, you actually founded and were uh, directing the experience or resource team. So you trained as a field investigator and then founded this program? Yes. After I trained as a field investigator, I was a state section director in New Hampshire. And then I went on uh, to become the, the national MUFON's director of field investigator training. And then in 2011, MUFON asked me to create the uh, experiencer, it was then the abduction research team, and it later became the experiencer resource team. I held that position for 10 years. What was behind the, the word abduction falling out of favor and it being replaced? I think contactee came before experiencer, and what, what's going on there with the, with the nomenclature? Well, it was sort of a political correctness. There was a, an outcry from people who had been taken to craft that it was not an abduction, that they did not feel they had been kidnapped, they hadn't been harmed, that abduction was a loaded term. Mm -hmm. And I'm fine with people who have been abducted um, <laughs> and feel traumatized by this and feel done against their will and they were not willing to cooperate using that term. But we just decided to use the word experiencer, Dr. John Mack from Harvard University. Sure. I know John's uh, work. Who, yes, who studied this uh, at length, had come up with the term experiencer, sort of as a generic term. It so captures everything. Defining yeah. someone as an abduct contactee. Experiencer covers all of those who 
had been in craft or in a non-human environment interacting with non-humans. Now, you're, uh, you remained close. I know that uh, Barney passed away, sadly, young, uh, but your relationship with Betty endured for the rest of her life. Uh, yes. And that the two of you together were uh, researching and continuing to ask the questions and try to answer as many of them as possible. Did did Betty ever doubt her memory or have second thoughts about whether her experience was real or was that just undeniable for her? For her, it was undeniable. She, I mean, there was all the conscious recall. There was the physical and circumstantial evidence, the missing time, the torn dress that uh, had developed a pink powdery coating on it. Uh, the, the tops of Barney's dress shoes were so deeply scraped that he had to buy new shoes. Their watches uh, had stopped running and never ran again. The spots on the trunk, there was all that evidence. You couldn't deny that something had occurred. Sure. But Betty insisted that what she remembered occurred on that craft did in fact occur. Now I had questions about that because I, I know that people can confabulate under hypnosis. Most of what is said under hypnosis is true. It is the person's per, uh, perception of what has occurred to them, which may not be consistent with the objective uh, truth entirely, but most often it is. It's only details that, that might be confabulated. I've, I've talked in the past with other guests about whether objective truth even exists or <laughs> whether each of us get to settle on a series of beliefs that feel right to us. I don't go so far as, you know, the popular phrase right now is for people to say that they're telling their truth, which I think can give you license to make up a whole bunch of stuff. But <laughs> um, I, in terms of there being a pure set of parameters that make up a universally objective truth, I wonder if we could ever really pin that down. Uh, so, and I know that with hypnosis, it's widely known that what someone is going to report in that state is going to be truly their perception. So objective truth kind of falls away even as being meaningful for me at that point. It's what she perceived. It's it's her reality, no doubt. Uh, but you said you had questions about it. I imagine you had a, a, a juicy opportunity uh, throughout your life to sit and have real heart-to-hearts with Betty. Uh, what was that like? Well, not only did I have heart to heart conversations with Betty, but she gave me the 10 hours of hypnosis sessions that she and Barney had had with Dr. Benjamin Simon, a renowned neuropsychiatrist mm -hmm. who saw Barney because he had developed a life threatening condition. Mm -hmm. He had been hospitalized with a bleeding ulcer that was related to this event that was caused by the emotional distress he was experiencing. So, so I transcribed all of those hypnosis tapes. I wasn't a good typist in those days either. It took me a long time. And then I lined up Betty's and Barney's statements to Dr. Simon through the entire trip and the part that they had amnesia for uh, to determine whether or not this had really occurred. And by the time I was finished, I was convinced that it had, because you know, even though Betty had had some dreams about it, this was in part different than her dreams and what she and Barney stated separately in hypnosis, where Dr. Simon had reinstated amnesia at the end of each session and saw them separately. They were saying the same thing. Fascinating. I mean, I imagine they were talking to each other at home about their experiences, but it doesn't sound like what you're reporting is like a corroborated account. Uh, and I wonder if that's even possible to do when you're in a hypnotic state is to like recount an agreed upon version of events based on a conversation that may have taken place between them outside of hypnosis. 
Well, the conversations between them were only what they had conscious recall for. They didn't know what they were reporting under hypnosis. No, they did not until Dr. Simon uh, had completed their sessions and then played the hypnosis tapes back to them. So they weren't listening to the results after each session. You're saying no. he, he uh, caused them to be amnesiac after each session. So Absolutely. there was no opportunity for corroboration. That's correct. Wow. That's fascinating. Now, you also ended up taking interest in and becoming a, a hypnotherapist as well. I imagine this experience, this transcription experience had something to do with that. Uh, did you did you hear those uh, recordings when Betty and Barney did initially or not until you got the transcripts later? I didn't listen to the recordings initially. The family believed that I was too young. Uh, I was 17, 18 years old mm -hmm. and older, but uh, there was a lot of raw emotion expressed sure. yeah. and they didn't want to traumatize me. I so, know most of those recordings are not publicly available, but there's a little clip here and there that you can find. Uh, and I've and I've listened to one of them. It was maybe just a minute long and it is gut wrenching. So I can imagine that is, for family members or even for uh, Betty and Barney themselves to be hearing themselves. I, I just recently started uh, using a sleep app in order to track some uh, night terrors that I've been having. And uh, the first time I captured myself screaming in my sleep and having no memory of it, it was really unsettling to think that's me and I don't even remember what in the world I was so upset about in that moment. That's just the tiniest tip of the iceberg for what it must have been like for them, I imagine. I know that at some point along the way, and I'll ask you, I'll invite you to tell me where it fits in the in the timeline, you began to become aware of your own personal experience with non-human entities. Where does that fit into the picture as we've been talking about it so far? I was a teenager when I had my first conscious recall that something very frightening and highly unusual had occurred. At that time, Betty was working with a team of scientists who were giving her a script and she would uh, attempt to send telepathic messages to these non-humans to ask them to come in, to show their craft to these scientists and also to land on my grandparents' farm. And in this time frame, when she was doing the secret experiment, there were many, many UFO sightings in that area. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's the time frame when the incident at Exeter occurred. It was actually in Kensington, mm -hmm. New Hampshire, where uh, a teenage boy out of high school and police officers observed a, a UFO close up. Many other people observed it. Um, our, our neighbors were seeing these craft. The fam family members had seen these craft. And one actually did come in and land on my grandparents' farm. Wow. I grew up across the street from my grandparents. There were two observers to this craft that night as it was coming in, landing. And uh, so it left physical trace evidence on the ground, and this was investigated. What I didn't ever tell anyone until just recently is that I had these memories of being taken, of finding myself on this craft. My mother was present. She also had the same memories of being taken to that craft. It was terrifying. In my 17-year-old mind, I kind of uh, came up with some convoluted reasoning that um, I must have needed surgery that I wasn't aware of, and that my mother had arranged a surgical team to go to my house in the middle of the night to do this surgery on me. But they weren't human. When I opened my eyes. I wasn't observing humans. I, I wasn't in a medical setting. It was, it was terrifying. But you had to have this overlay uh, logic to 
be settled with it? I think just to cope with it. Sure. And I couldn't tell people this wasn't something you told the public. Yeah. I didn't want my life to be ruined. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I just, just held on to this. I, my mother and I eventually uh, talked to Dr. James Harder, who was working with uh, my Aunt Betty. He was the uh, chief uh, investigator for, the, uh, for APRO. Uh, a re another research investigation organization at that time frame. He was a hypnotist, but he was a college professor of engineering. When did you talk about this first with your mother and discover that she shared the memory with you? Was it at the time or later? It wasn't the following day. Following day, I had uh, areas of my body that were extraordinarily painful. I had not experienced that kind of pain before. In fact, uh, I couldn't sit on a hard chair. I had to sit on a pillow. My mother was relatively unconcerned, which was unusual. You know, she, it was like she knew something. Wow. And that's why you know, I thought, oh, she had this done to me. I don't know why, mm -hmm. <laughs> but she had this done to me and she just didn't want to talk about it. But later, it was in the probably early to mid 1970s, when we discussed all of this with Dr. Harder, I found out that my mother was an experiencer as what, well. Was this an isolated incident or was it something that happened more than once? It happened more than once. Do you have memory of more than one experience? Yes, I had partial recall of more than one experience with witnesses to the craft. I still wanted to be sufficiently skeptical mm -hmm. and try to explain all of this away as being something else. But there was physical evidence, there were witnesses who saw the craft, and I just simply couldn't dismiss it. Does it still frighten you to think about today? When I go back during the earlier days, I can feel that fright, but I'm not frightened any longer. I've worked through all of it. It took years, but I worked through it. And I, I think it was all of the research in this field and the knowledge that I had obtained and, and the fact that I could step back and get a better perspective on what had occurred and uh, having the opportunity to have conscious recall of interacting with these entities, of being told that uh, I would not be harmed, that they loved me, of feeling this electrical tingling sensation in my own body, and knowing that they were only attempting to my vibrational frequency, that they were concerned about toxins, environmental toxins in my body that could have an impact on my health. They were really concerned about me and what living on this earth was doing to me. Uh, were these the classically reported telepathic conversations that you had? They were yeah. and were these nature. the same entities that were described by uh, Barney uh, with the black uniforms? Yes, they were the same types of entities. And were they greys or were they some other form of entity? They were a race of greys. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, you're talking about the vast knowledge uh, that you have gained over your lifetime with all of the amazing research that you have done, which honestly, I, I'm going to applaud you up and down because we need to understand it's not, it's no longer a question of, is this happening or is it not? It's really a question of thousands and thousands of people can't be having a mass hysteria event or, you know, be delusional in exactly the same way. So clearly something is going on. And to have people without a, I'm just going to say political agenda to either reveal or conceal 
just to have people who are after the truth, the, the Fox Mulder approach. <laughs> I want to believe and I want to know the, the truth. Uh, I love that there are organizations like MUFON and people like you who are researching this in a very genuine and very thorough manner. I think it's important. And I would encourage people who have only a passing interest in this, especially because it's becoming so mainstream right now, to look into it a little more deeply, like read some of this research before making up your mind, or maybe even suspend making up your mind altogether, because honestly, I don't think all the facts are in yet. Uh, but what do you feel most comfortable with in terms of what the agenda is for these entities, or whether there is one agenda or whether there are multiple agendas based on uh, races? Uh, wh what does your knowledge point to at this point? I will say that the majority of these non-human entities uh, appear to be genuinely concerned about the preservation of life on our planet. They have told uh, time and time again, experiencers that uh, they are here to guide and assist in our development, that they've been here for thousands and thousands of years, that they have more of a presence now uh, and have had since we began to detonate nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. I know that's a big part of, of this. Destructive impact of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. They're extraordinarily concerned about environmental collapse and about nuclear war and the impact that all of that could have on our planet. You know, we know that they have hovered over nuclear weapons silos near nuclear weapons bases right. and shut down, then taken the nuclear weapons offline. Yes, I've um, read about that. <laughs> uh, do Have you heard of anybody reporting that, that, that these entities have made a claim that they are our creators or that they are us? What do you think is, is driving this level of interest and concern for our well-being? In all of the investigations that I've done, I've discovered that some people appear to be interacting with entities who claim that they originated on this planet before an environmental collapse, so that they had the technology to leave and to establish uh, life elsewhere on a planet that isn't nearly as nice as ours, mm -hmm. uh, but that they come back from time to time just to observe what is occurring here. There are others who are here, you know, they say they're here from other planets in our galaxy, and that they say that they planted our seed here, and that they are, of course, here to assist in our development. So that doesn't cover the area, and I'm a little bit of a nerd about this particular area, there is the school of thought that some of these entities may be either uh, space time or dimensional travelers, and they may actually be future us. Uh, have you encountered that at all in your research? I have encountered that too. There are several theories on what they are, and there are reasons for these various theories. I have uh, the correspondence files between a Navy rear admiral and uh, the Canadian UFO government desk guy uh, who was a brilliant engineer, Wilbert Smith. And they were actually communicating with these non-human entities who were in a different dimension, but sometimes would materialize. So then, then the question is, are they interdimensional entities who are just living here on our planet, but have somehow been able to break through into our dimension and interact with us? Or are they interdimensionals coming here from elsewhere? So uh, there are just so many questions. The possibilities that we don't have are just, to. yeah, just endless. And endlessly fascinating uh, to me. 
I want you to move in next door to me so that I could just come over for tea every day and pick your brain <laughs> because there are more questions than I can possibly ask in a one hour interview. But let me do ask you, um, what does your work look like today? I know that you're not uh, active with MUFON any longer, but you've written some amazing books that I imagine are for the edification of people who are both experiencers and not. So let's talk about that collection of work and what those books are about. Yes, I have written six books. One is called The Alien Abduction Files, and it's on six cases uh, that I investigated. I've highlighted two major cases uh, where I used hypnosis, and uh, there was a tremendous amount of evidence that this was real. And I also highlighted the first study that Denise Stoner and I cooperated on, on um, 50 experiencers and 75, uh, 25 people from the general population. We were wanted to compare the two groups to determine if experiencers had any characteristics that were different than uh, just your average guy on the street. And we did discover Physical characteristics or uh, personality characteristics or what, what kind of characteristics? Gifts. They be uh -huh. have become psychic or intuitive, uh -huh. empathic. And uh, that means that you it's a psychic sense of, of another person's emotions or the, even the wellness of the body, sensing it as if it were your own in your own body they uh, be, had become less materialistic, less concerned about the things that the average person in the United States is. They, they don't try to keep up with uh, their neighbors and the acquisition of, of material goods, that sort of thing. They have a different perspective, become more spiritually oriented individuals they uh, tend to have maybe a little bit of a boost in IQ. Uh, they felt that they had acquired knowledge that had never been taught to them, that they had never read about or seen elsewhere. So uh, just a number of different characteristics. Some actually have the ability to channel healing to others. So. You know, a number of the things you just mentioned are also associated with uh, people who have had near-death experiences. Uh, yes. I, I wonder what kind of crossover and connection there may be there. Uh, that's that's fascinating. Uh, I wonder that too. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Kenneth Ring and Chris Ozing, uh, two professors at uh, the University of Connecticut, did a major study on experiencers that what they then called abductees versus near death experience. Really? And oh. they had a couple of control groups too. And they discovered that the characteristics are nearly identical among near death experiencers yeah. and experiences of contact. The only difference is that the experiences of contact had a, kind of a higher level of trauma in their background, which is understandable. If, you know, if this is, and I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that that a, that an abduction experience involves the physical body, where a near death experience takes place outside of the body. So there's more opportunity, I think, for trauma when you're physically removed from your environment and placed in such an unusual set of circumstances. Oh, Absolutely. and I came up with that independently in our conversation, making that connection. That's fascinating to me. Very good observation. Little, little pat on my own back for that one. <laughs> um, you also wrote a book called, I think, something along the lines of what to do if you're abducted or something. Yes, that... yes. Extraterrestrial contact. What to do when you've been abducted. And it's a comprehensive guide for experiencers, for uh, psychotherapists, and hypnotherapists, and also for members of the general population who just want to know more about this. I, I wrote about some of um, my different types of cases and the best cases. Uh, also, um, psychotherapist Madeline Tobias joined me to, to write about the uh, processing that we go through as we move from uh, experiencing trauma and fear 
to um, integrating all of this into our conscious recall. And also a brilliant woman, Anne Castle, uh, who has a background in psychology, but is also a gifted psychic. And Denise Stoner, who uh, is an experiencer, a lifelong experiencer, I believe she's my local MUFON director. I'm in, I'm in Florida. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, she is. And she's also the, the current uh, assistant director of MUFON's experience or resource team. Well, that'll be my next purchase, that book. (laughs) I didn't tell you that right now. My latest book is uh, Forbidden Knowledge, a personal journey from Uh, alien abduction to spiritual transformation. Oh, that's a wonderful segue. There's a, a, when I read your bio at the beginning of this interview, I had um, edited it down from the information that you sent me. And I omitted a compelling statement that you made in the bio that I just didn't include for brevity's sake here, where you said, I'll just read the sentence to you. Prior to 2012, you'd straddled the uneasy path between scientific materialism and the paraphysical. Everything changed when profound events in your personal life radically altered your worldview and transformed your perception of the nature of reality and initiated a broader approach to your investigations and research. I would love to invite you to expand on that, please. (laughs) Well, in 2012, I was working on this first study. And one of the participants was a man from Australia. And he is a medium. He's also an experiencer of contact and had a great deal of insight. In that time frame, I was still scared silly. And I thought thinking that this was much more negative than I now believe it is. I'm not saying it's not negative. Some of it is, tiny percentage. But he offered me the opportunity to communicate with these Zeta non-humans. And so I decided I wanted to do that. And we did this via Skype. And it was a little terrifying. But finally, I gained the courage to say, look, I have been ill for many years. I had an experience where I was returned from an abduction and I was extraordinarily ill. I had the symptoms of exposure to radiation. I had burns on my face, on my back. I still have the scars on my back. Wow. Uh, my eyes were burned. They were inflamed. And then I became extremely ill. I, I had difficulty walking. I lost a great deal of weight. And the impact of all of this had remained with me for a number of years. And I just wanted to be healed. And so the funny thing was this little uh, Zeta said, oh, another sick human. Oh, boy. (laughs) (laughs) But four nights later, I woke up with incredible pain in my body. In fact, I woke my husband up and said, you might have to take me to the hospital. I don't know what's going on. Maybe I'm having a heart attack. And he said, well, give it a minute and and see what happens. And so the next thing I knew, I was in a different environment. I was no longer in my bed. I was lying on a table or a gurney of some kind. There were tall entities who were glowing up uh, near my head. It was kind of a, a misty or cloudy environment. But when I began to wonder what is happening, they showed me, and I'm not sure if it was a vision or a screen, but I saw the outline of my body lying on that table. I saw sort of like little bots running through the periphery of my body. And I saw certain organs that were highlighted in pink or mint green. And uh, I was still in intense pain but they said, told me that the healing was almost complete. And so I was happy about that. I woke up again in my bed in the morning, and I have not had any of those symptoms since. That wasn't really that long ago, 2012. Uh, 10, 11 years. Yeah. 
So it says that this had a profound effect on your worldview. What changed for you as a result of that experience? Well, with that experience, I realized that these ETs were not all negative, that they had healed me. Also, I was willing to face the possibility that they were not living in our three-dimensional environment, that they could come into our environment and take us to their maybe different dimensional. Not necessarily up into the sky aboard a craft. Yes. Uh Yes. And I knew that uh, they could put, insert their consciousness into an orb and that conscious orb could come into my environment. So these orbs that are so often described, uh, they're usually in the yellow, orange, red color spectrum uh, in my reading, and they vary in size. It sounds like what you're suggesting is that that those are not necessarily entities in and of themselves, but rather vessels or vehicles for consciousness. Did I get that anywhere near right? (laughs) Yes, that they. I said they could insert their consciousness Mm -hmm. into an orb. So, you know, whatever that is, but, uh, and then they can also be blue and they, they actually, an orb did come into the room of an experiencer that whose case I investigated loads of evidence in that case, he had developed cancer. I advised him to ask the ETs for healing. He was able to capture this orb on video Oh, wow. Coming into his bedroom, flying across the room and entering his body. And it healed his cancer. There's medical evidence that he had cancer and that he did not have cancer after this occurred. Is his story in one of your books? It is. Which one? Uh, His story is in um, Extraterrestrial Contact, What to Do When You've Been Abducted. My Next Purchase. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> I want to so, see the video, Kathleen. <laughs> it's an amazing story. Uh, also, the photographs of this this orb that healed him, and uh, unfortunately, it, it's in black and white. Uh, but uh, it is just the most beautiful shade of uh, baby blue, light blue, with uh, white and then a golden center. Fascinating. What does life look like for you now? Are you still writing? Are you still doing hypnosis? Are you retired? Are you traveling and speaking? <laughs> I, I doubt that I will ever retire from, from this field. It's just so fascinating. I'm still looking for answers. Nobody has the answers. So, But I am working on a couple of new books. Right now, I'm working on a chapter on a book for um, pertaining to my uh, hypnosis with Calvin Parker, 1973 Pascagoula, uh, Mississippi UFO abduction. And um, he was uh, captured with uh, Charlie Hickson. Uh-huh. I'm working on that. I'm working on a new uh, survey. Dr. Melanie Barton Bragg, who is uh, an ordained minister and a psychotherapist, uh, and I are working on this together now. And uh, you can go to my website at kathleen-marden.com and to fill out this survey. We would truly appreciate it if you would. It's for the general public. how long will that survey be available? Uh, it will be available until we have about a thousand participants. Uh, we're looking not only for experiencers, but also for the general public, because this is a survey on religious belief and extraterrestrial life. So you don't necessarily have to be attached to either one in order That's to correct. participate in the survey. I saw that, I saw your post about that and I actually did participate. Oh, thank uh, you. So this gives me one more opportunity. I shared that uh, post on my social media, but this gives me one more opportunity to uh, introduce that to other people. And yeah, I would encourage everybody to 
surveys can only be made better. Research can only be made better when you have more and more data points. So whoever you are and whatever your beliefs are, why not take the less than five minutes that it took me to go ahead and complete that survey? And I will uh, link to your website in my show notes, as well as I imagine these books that you've written are all easily obtainable on Amazon or wherever books are sold. They are, but you can uh, order autographed copies from my website. Fantastic. What did I not ask you, Kathleen? Is there something that I've uh, glossed over or something else that you wanted to make sure we made uh, known today? Well, I want everyone to know that uh, I'm going to be posting my public appearances this year uh, on my website. And so uh, if you're interested in uh, seeing me at a UFO conference, uh, attending one of my lectures, you'll be able to uh, see that on my website as soon as they're posted. I want to thank you for spending this time with me, entertaining my questions, the silly ones and the serious ones, and for just being utterly delightful to talk with. Uh, I've known about you and I've seen other interviews with you and I've read your book. And so to have this chance to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and to hear you tell your story while looking me right in the eye is a very special, special thing. So I'm very grateful. I hope we have an opportunity to meet at some point in the future as well. Well, thank you so much. And no question is silly. It was a great pleasure and a great honor to speak with Kathleen today. And I hope that you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. My closing thought today, I couldn't think of a better way to close an episode like this than to invoke the spirit of David Bowie. So it's going to be a song lyric today. I'm sure you're all going to remember this one. There's a star man waiting in the sky. He'd like to come and meet us, but he thinks he'd blow our minds. There's a star man waiting in the sky. He's told us not to blow it because he knows it's all worthwhile. And on that note, I'm going to say thanks for listening. Come on back and I will see you next time. Cool Gray in Studio A is a fine-tuned services production. It exists for entertainment purposes and is not intended to be used as a sole source of information or advice on any subject. Find and follow this podcast at coolgraystudios.com.